this is um, me as a kid. I used to have blocks. I would um, make little buildings, and I had Legos, and I'd uh, make cities out of them, and I had books on the case study architects, and I, I, I wanted to be an architect. I wanted to be Frank Lloyd Wright. I got to college, and I learned, uh, first of all, that I have neither the talent nor temperament to be an architect. Um, I also learned that he, he actually was kind of an asshole, so that <laughs> seems to be an option. But I learned about this guy. This is Jim Rouse. Um, he, was a, he was actually the first developer to commercialize the mall. That's the Santa Monica Place old school uh, before they tore the roof off. Uh, Frank Gehry was a longtime uh, architect with Rouse. He developed the whole concept of the festival marketplace. That's Faneuil Hall in Boston. He, in the 70s, created what's still considered today the first planned city in the US, Columbia, Maryland. In the 80s, he started what's, what's still the largest support of affordable housing, the enterprise. So Rouse got uh, very famous doing all this. Um, we're in LA, a little Hollywood moment. That's his grandson, Ed Norton Jr., who was born in Columbia, Maryland, who's on the enterprise board. So studying Rouse, I um, uh, concluded a few things. First of all, he helped me to appreciate that there are companies that wed profit and purpose. It turned out Rouse was a, a very religious guy and he felt that it was his God-given responsibility to do good work with the work he was doing. Now, he never talked about that to investors. To investors, it was all about ROI. Um, and for the most part, he did well for, for investors. But to his employees, he talked about how the things they were doing were, were really helping to improve communities. So he developed them all, for example, because in the 50s, the affordable housing were in the suburbs. And there was no, he felt that the suburbs needed a town square. He felt that they needed a place for people to congregate and play. And he saw malls as an all-weather town square. So that's why he got into it. By the 70s, uh, you had um, people moving out from city centers. And so he became an expert in urban renewal. And he created the festival marketplace, Faneuil Hall, South Street Seaport, Harbor Place, and Baltimore as a way to bring people back into city centers. So I, like Rouse, felt in onus to try to add value through my work. Mine, based not so much on any kind of religion, had a spiritual component, but more just kind of a golden rule. I felt like it was, I should add value through my work. And I recognized, this is in college when I was learning about Rouse, that people like teachers and nonprofit folks and people who work in healthcare do it directly every day through the work they did, but Rouse helped me to appreciate that their businesses were integral and that which makes your product or service successful are things that make it purposeful. And I said, that's a cool concept, because when you create a successful business, let's define that as a profitable business, never easy to do, but when you do, then you have something that can sustain and grow your business, and whatever beneficence is integral in that product or service, it spreads. So I said, hopefully someday I'll do that. Two, he helped me to, 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 to appreciate that developers are more important than architects, because developers hire architects, or they don't, and they allow them to do cool, responsible things or not. So he said, I should become a developer because I have no talent to be an architect. Developers are more important and I, I felt like the world could use more responsible developers like Rouse. So that's the background. When I finally got into real estate, so I spent a couple decades in tech, and when I finally got into real estate a few years ago, I thought this market was a rocket ship that would take off and never come back. I was wrong about that. But um, I, I recognized that there were a group of consumers, variously called the cultural creatives, who really appreciate design in the products they buy, right? So they're buying uh, uh, Michael Graves products at, at, at Target and Apple and buying select pieces from Design Within Reach and maybe more stuff from Ikea and reading Wired and Dwell and doing yoga. And these are also people who really appreciate products that are built in a healthy and sustainable way. So they're driving Priuses and buying from Patagonia and shopping at Whole Foods. These consumers are variously called the cultural creatives. The problem is that the, the production home builders, the KB Homes, Lunaris, Pulte, Centex is the world, don't build for that audience. So he said, I'm going to start a company that gets world-class architects, doesn't screw up the great work they do, integrates an extremely comprehensive environmental program, and then uses factory production to build what we build better, quicker, cheaper, and with smaller ecological footprint. So we work with Ray Cappy, who started SciArc, uh, one of my favorite all-time architects, Kieran Timberlake, they were the AIA firm of the year a few years ago. We've done some standard homes with them. Um, now, we're working with prefab, and a quick primer on prefab. 
and I'll move from things that happen mostly in the factory to things that happen mostly on site, pre, before you get on site, fabrication. So the biggest category are manufactured homes, basically mobile homes, and they have to conform to HUD, housing and urban development, they have to be mobile. Um, modular is more what we do, it's like big Lego pieces that that um, uh, come together. Panelize is doing walls or, or maybe uh, roofs and pieces, more site work. And then the last category, kit, where all the pieces are pre-cut, but you still have a lot of work to do on site. Now, prefab isn't something that's a solution for all kinds of building types, but when it works, you can, first of all, improve quality. You're working in a controlled environment, so you have jigs, you can make sure that your angles are true. Um, uh, you, uh, with gr better quality, you can get greater energy efficiency and durability. Um, absolutely, you can do things faster, right? Because typical site build construction, you do your site work, and only then can you start to frame the building to do all the infrastructure. Whereas with prefab, as you're doing the foundation, you're doing the uh, structure off-site. So you can do things in half to a third of the time. Less waste, the average site built home, maybe two to, to uh, sorry, 30 to 40% of your materials end up in landfill. Incredibly wasteful versus maybe two to 10% for, for a prefabricated home because you can, uh, you have a single centralized in, uh, 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 building where you're doing your work. You can store and reuse your materials with less materials, with faster construction schedule, with less administrative overhead, dealing with lots of subs, you can reduce the cost. So those are some of the advantages of prefab. So this is um, some of our homes in various stages of undress, and this is a video of a home we actually installed at the TED conference. Um, so it was a temporary foundation, this is in Long Beach. Um, it, it took us about three months to build the four modules that comprise the home. The home is about 2,000 square feet, and it took us about three hours to install it and then three days to finish it up. So we can do things very quickly. I mean, that's like a third of the time typically you would spend to do a home. So that's the first module coming down. Um, there's a second one. That's the kitchen module. It actually has the um, appliances installed. Um, the bathrooms have all the tiles, all the grouting. So the only thing we have to do once the home is there is any places where materials, for example, the cladding, um, uh, intersects a boundary line, then we have to, of course, do that on site and connect the utilities. And um, as I said, we were able to finish that very, very quickly. And then that home got moved to Newport Beach. So this is um, uh, now, this is the first home we ever did. Um, this is designed by Ray Cappy. This is actually my home in Santa Monica. And um, you all are welcome to, to, to come tour it. Um, uh, uh, I say with some reservation, by the way, but um, that, 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 that's my email. I don't know about the whole serving tea part, but um, uh, actually, let's go back. There's the Legos I used to uh, play with as a kid. How am I doing on time? Not bad. Um, by the way, I think I'm going to set the record tonight for the most slides ever shown um, at, at, at your event. I, that's what I'm working on. Um, so one of the things, and, and my home, by the way, is the first home ever to be certified LEED Platinum, um, which I'll explain in a second. This is a home we did with a guy who's in the audience um, and, and another friend. Uh, this was in Brentwood. This is a home we did in Newport Beach. Um, uh, this is the first LEED Platinum home in Newport Beach. Uh, that's the home that was installed at TED, by the way. Um, uh, this is the first LEED Platinum multifamily done in San Francisco. Uh, this is our first, our second project with Kieran Timberlake, our first multifamily. Um, and then I think one of the most successful things we've done is, uh, you may like our homes, you may not, I hope you do, but um, the environmental program is pretty unprecedented, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, but it doesn't hit you in the face. I mean, you, again, you may not like the design, but you're probably not thinking, oh my God, that's a green home. It's just a nice home, but it's built in a responsible way. That's, that's like our, our key imperative. First, solve the, the value people place on great form and functionality. This is a, a home that we're in the production on in Toronto. It'll be our first community of four living homes. Um, that's what the inside should look like. So, quick step back, you know, why care about this stuff? It turns out that the biggest users, consumers of energy in this country are not um, industry, isn't transportation, it's buildings. Specifically, the energy used to heat, cool, and light buildings is about 39% of all 
U.S. energy. If we look at electricity, it's 71%. If we look at some of these other metrics, it's about 39% of carbon, 65% uh, uh, of waste output. 40% of all raw materials that are extracted on this planet are used for building materials. So the, the bad news is if you care about if you believe the thesis that we have a relatively short amount of time to radically change the way we build products, the way we consume, or there will be increasing and increasingly bad climate change, negative climate change. The bad news is the buildings that we live in, that we play in, that we learn in, um, they're the worst problems. The good news is the technology, if you will, to dramatically reduce the energy use, the water use, the resource use, um, it exists. You can buy it at Home Depot. It's no more expensive than non-sustainable materials. So um, we really do have the ability, uh, unlike, by the way, some of the other things that you hear about, for example, um, uh, electric cars that are cost effective and then also have um, a greater than 40 um, mile uh, range or cellulosic uh, ethanol process that doesn't compete with food stock. Unlike some of these other areas where, frankly, they're still working on the science, we really can reduce dramatically the ecological footprint of buildings uh, but it takes people understanding what the materials are, what the systems are, um, and, and that's happening more and more. And in fact, what I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about are some of the things that we do to reduce the ecological footprint of our buildings. And everything I'm going to talk about are things you can do in your own homes, in your own schools, in your own uh, uh, offices. So um, I, I hope this inspires some of you. Um, we use the LEAD program, which I've mentioned a few times, as an external measure of what we're doing. LEAD stands for Leadership in Environmental and Energy Design. It's a green building certification program that was started uh, in 2000 by the United States Green Building Council, and it's a point-based system, so you get points for things that you do that make your buildings more water, energy, or resource efficient. Um, but the problem with LEAD is that it really doesn't kind of directly um, uh, measure or at least um, give you criteria for reducing um, things like energy, water, emissions, carbon waste. Um, uh, it's implied that if you get those points, you're, you're going to reduce it. But we developed a program we call Z6, and we're trying to make our homes as much as possible. Zero energy, zero water, which is to say for, pot of, for irrigation, we want to reclaim the water we need. Zero emissions, which is an indoor air quality issue. Zero carbon, zero waste. So that has to do with how materials are, are created. And then you can do lots of things to reduce the ecological footprint of your buildings. But if the people who live in them don't make responsible choices, you're going to have a big ecological footprint. So we have to deal with ignorance, too. So in the time I have left, which is very limited, um, uh, energy is the most important category to get right. Your, building will use far more energy over its useful life of 30, 40, 50 years than is embodied in the materials. So think about LED lights that use a tenth of the power of incandescent, uh, of, uh, incandescent lights. Think about radiant heating, hot water that heats through the floors, it rises, it uses less uh, power than conventional heating systems, energy star appliances, photovoltaics to create the power you need for water, like energy, first reduce the demand, so low flow water fixtures, dual flush toilets. Um, uh, all of our homes come gray water ready, so that's using sink, shower, bath water for irrigation. And then uh, we encourage our clients to install cisterns that store rainwater runoff. For emissions, which is an indoor air quality issue, there's more and more research su suggesting that things like formaldehyde, urea, volatile organic compounds, um, uh, mold, these are things you find in the adhesives in, in carpets and in paints. and um, and in wood, uh, more and more research suggesting linkages between skin, head, eye uh, irritations, uh, even some cancer. So all of our, our millwork is formaldehyde free. Our fireplaces burn denatured alcohol, so no smoke, almost no carbon. We do indoor uh, gardens. We, we found some research NASA did in plants that, that uh, actually filter uh, indoor air and that produce lots of oxygen. For carbon and waste, steel is the most recycled building material. You can source wood. Uh, from Forest Stewardship Council. It's a nonprofit that certifies that wood is grown and harvested in a sustainable way. You can get that from Home Depot. There are tiles, beautiful tiles you can get from glass, uh, countertops from recycled glass and mirrors, or even cellulose. Um, uh, the last thing I'll mention is um, two things. One, uh, uh, we think homes should um, adapt to people's changing lifestyle needs. You, you're single, you get married, you have some kids, you have more kids, the in-laws move in. So things like 
uh, movable walls and millwork that you can change and internal and external space that you can expand. We think that's an important capability for homes. The last thing, for ignorance, um, I of course drive a Prius. Um, uh, anyone else drive a Prius? Um, I, I could ask uh, what your mileage is, you would tell me because there's a screen in Genius that tells you in real time what your mileage is, it gives you feedback. The engineers here could tell us any system with feedback tends to improve. It becomes like a video game for us. We just want to get our mileage up as much as possible. We brag to each other. And so we, we worked with a company to develop a system for our homes that gives you real-time feedback. So um, I think that's all the time I have. And um, again, I, I'm serious. You all are welcome to come tour the home anytime. Thank you.